Welcome back to Horns High Studios for another episode of 666 Seconds of Murder. That means each one of these videos is less than 666 seconds or 11 minutes and 6 seconds. So let's get to it. Got a lot to cover as always in a short amount of time, but that's why you guys like these videos. We're going back to the Idaho 4 and the concept of could these guys have been wearing night vision goggles? Something that's been on my mind for a while. But remember, these videos are for informational purposes only. Just opinion and speculation. I'm not saying anybody's guilty of anything. All right, This is just for our discussion here about a case that interests all of us. Now, I've often wondered if the persons who carried out this crime possibly operated like the military when it comes to attacking the victims in the dark with night vision goggles. This would be a tremendous advantage for the assailants, especially if one or two people uh, were in a house with six people. So if you had one or two assailants in a house full of six people, this could have been definitely been an advantage. And I've mentioned before that I'm a disabled vet who served during the Desert Storm era. I was in the Army from 1991 to 94, and I was a cavalry scout. We used tanks, helicopters, and ground troops to do reconnaissance of the enemy. Now, we often trained with night vision goggles, and I've driven military vehicles wearing them. I'm sure the ones of today are a lot better than the ones we had back 30 years ago. Now, I know that Brent Kopaka's name has been thrown around regarding this case, and I have no idea if he was involved. But if he was, then this theory might hold a little bit more, you know, a little more weight than uh, if he was not, or if somebody in the military was not. Um, even if Brent wasn't part of it, I mean, anyone who studies military assaults would know that you have the upper hand if you conducted the operation in the dark wearing night vision. Now, I searched Amazon and found all sorts of these goggles for a little more than a hundred US dollars, which surprised me. Um, so these would have been very accessible to anybody. Um, and you know, just a little bit more than the K-bar knife would have cost. So how does night vision work? Well, it uses thermal imaging technology to sense small amounts of light that are reflected off objects and then electronically amplified to, pr to produce a greenish image. And I was surprised when I looked this up that the images I was looking at weren't that much better than what I remembered from 30 years ago. But I'm sure there are improvements and definitely one big improvement would be the uh, cumbersome ones that we wore as compared to the more sleek versions they make now that you, know, you can strap onto your head very easily. Remember that the basement bedroom that no one was using, remember that room? Well, the one that was at that Ashland couch was leasing, but she wasn't living there. And that whole thing does seem a little odd to me. I mean, there could be a legitimate reason for her not living there. I mean, we do know she was friends with Dylan, and most of us think she's incredibly suspicious here. And Ashland was at the house on that Friday, a couple days before this happened, uh, for a big party there. So, you know, kind of strange, but in pictures of that bedroom that I've seen, there is a power panel on that outside wall. Now, when I first came up with this theory about how these attacks could have been carried out, that's what, that's what sparked my interest was that power panel. So let's just say that the people who carried out this attack were let in the house and then, you know, um, you know, hid until everybody got home and that empty bedroom would be a perfect place for them to hang out. Um, and once they got word that the targets were in the house, then they did what they did. Now, in my opinion, Dylan and Bethany were likely not in the house while the attacks were going on. I've mentioned this before, but I do feel that they left before things kicked off and then returned the next morning to hatch these stories that they wound up telling the police. I mean, that's my opinion. Um, now, um, 
Once the attackers got the word that the targets were in their respective bedrooms, then they could have shut all the electricity off uh, in that entire house from that power panel. I mean, is that why Kaylee was frantically trying to get in touch with Jack DeCore to see if he still had power since he lived right close to them? Or was maybe, was she scared because the power went off and then all of a sudden they're hearing noises and maybe that Xana and Ethan were attacked before they were, we don't know. But, you know, it's an interesting, uh, you know, uh, scenario. If the assailants had night vision on, they would have been able to move through that house in pitch black and the four victims wouldn't have had much of a chance. I mean, not to mention the fact that, you know, they didn't have any weapons that we're aware of other than maybe Ethan's golf clubs. The attackers in this house were armed with big knives and I'm thinking hatchets and or machetes based on the damage that they did to these victims. I've always wondered if the K-Bar was given to one of the girls from a boyfriend or, or a friend who was fearful of the situation that had been going on in that house. We know that Kaylee moved out. Maddie was still there. And we've heard rumors that she was sick and tired of what was going on there. We know that Xana's dad came right before this happened and changed the lock on her door. That seems suspicious. Uh, we know, uh, you know, that the knife was maybe already there um, and for their protection. And that's how the sheath ended up on the bed. Maybe the attacker saw it, grabbed it from them, and either used it against them or kept it with all the rest of their stuff that they were going to get rid of. I mean, who knows, right? And then they just left the sheath behind and then took all the rest of the stuff and disposed of it with the rest like they probably did somewhere. I mean, who knows where. Um, but with no legitimate means to protect themselves, in addition to being drunk or possibly under other substances, these victims were sitting ducks. And these guys, if they had night vision on and there was no light in that house whatsoever, they would have had a huge advantage. I mean, did Bethany see these people with the night vision on? And maybe that's the exculpatory evidence. Who knows, right? Now, I don't hear uh, anyone or I haven't heard of anybody that reported the house was, you know, totally dark for a period of time. But if these guys did, did this in a pretty short amount of time at the hour that they did it, probably it, it could have gone unnoticed. Uh, who knows? But I think it's important in a case like this to explore all the possibilities. Now, I know I catch some flack in the comments from some people who watch these videos and think my claims are ridiculous. Well, I'm very upfront about stating that my videos are speculation. But it's not blind speculation. It's based on the facts that we've been given and my observations. Those of us in the true crime community are far from stupid, and we know how to connect the dots. Now, I've been doing the Murder Metal Mayhem podcast for six years. Uh, it's a weekly podcast, and I have seen patterns with true crime cases. There are a lot of similarities in the attackers that carry out crimes like this signatures that are common between them, things in their past that have contributed to the animals that they've become to carry out the most heinous things imaginable. When I see these patterns and apply it to a case like this, it opens up doors and theories that maybe some people aren't thinking about. And it's your comments that helps fuel that and I really appreciate that. And I do read as many of them as possible. And I respond to as many of them as possible. Um, another thing about that vacant room before we go, I've speculated that this could have been where some product was being stored. And I know that Crime Circus did videos about the wall where the closet was and a possible secret door. Now, I don't believe that there were tunnels connected to that house. But I do feel that that could have possibly led to some sort of secret area or a hidden area, maybe a panic room, uh, maybe a, a stash for putting stuff in there, or maybe it was a mechanical room, you know, the furnace, the water heater, all the mechanical stuff that could possibly have been the access to that. I just don't know. 
Um, or maybe there was a bunch of surveillance gear in there. I know I did a video recently about that. So it's interesting, but I do think there's something there. I just don't know what. Okay. Now let me know down in the comments what you guys think about this one. I mean, could these have been carried out by kind of a military style attack with night vision? It's certainly something to think about. I do want to say thank you to the Horns High Club. You guys are awesome. I really appreciate your support very much. And I appreciate all you guys that watch these videos along with me. So we'll see you next time on 666 Seconds of Murder.